I think the first thing there is we need to acknowledge that quiet quitting is not a new thing, right? I think it's been packaged very nicely at the moment in terms of the conversation. But, you know, looking at employee disengagement, that's something that's been really well studied over a number of years. And I think we need to go back to really understand why are employees disengaged? And one of the key things that I think is popping up where the quiet quitting movement does have a very, very good point to make is really around unrealistic expectations because we've mm. gotten into this culture. You know, work is everything. I have to give everything for work. I think the narrative is shifting. And I think that's where HR needs to play a role to say, how do we have a much more balanced narrative that says, you know, treat employees like with you as human beings, look at meaningful work, but there's also a reality around organizational productivity and certain boundaries, etc. And I think that's what needs to shift. Hello, everyone, and welcome to HR Hot Topics, which is the show in which we talk about some of the stories that we've read in the news and we give some context on how they impact the world of work and us as HR professionals as well. My name is Eric van Volpen and with me is Dieter Veldsman. And let's dive into our main story. But before we do, don't forget to like this video and subscribe to stay tuned to more updates. If you're interested in some of the other stories that we have, because we have a much longer episode in the AIHR Academy, check us out at AIHR.com. Let's start. Dieter, the children are back to school. We are back at work. The holidays are over. Let's talk about a couple of headlines that we're seeing because the world of work has changed quite dramatically. And I'm very curious and I would love to make up the balance of the next couple of months before the end of the year. What will we see? Because we're seeing a lot of different trends. We're seeing inflation and cost of living rising. We see labor unrest. We see strikes everywhere in Europe. We see attempts of unionization in the US. We see quiet quitting happening and the anti-work movement. Movement. And we see the work from home debate continue and we see rising gas prices in Europe. So these are four big trends and I think it would be good to look at some of the different headlines. And I'll kick it off with inflation and the rising cost of living because I was reading a comment uh, recently on, on a collective bargaining um, uh, here in the Netherlands for the National mm -hmm. Railway and there was someone complaining saying, you know, a 5% increase this year and a 2.5% increase in January, it's 7.5% but inflation is at 11%. You know, this is not the way to treat employees. And I think there's a lot of dissatisfaction when it comes to um, the cost of living. And my question is, Dieter, what is the role of companies when it comes to inflation and the rising cost mm. of living? I think, Eric, the first thing is companies cannot be silent on the matter because I think a lot of mm. organizations don't necessarily think that it is something that they do or are in a position to do anything about. And I think the silence there is not helping them with regards to the relationship with their employees. So I think that's mm. just the first given that we do need to talk about with regards to that. I think, secondly, there's really a role here also for us to think of new innovative solutions that deals with this within the current context that we find ourselves in. So organizations have to think about, let's not make short-term decisions that's going to impact the viability of some of these solutions in the longer term. So I wouldn't just mm. immediately say, you know what, we're increasing salaries across the board to deal with, you know, the cost of living allowance or, you know, to provide a COLA over the next couple of years to deal with that. I would think a little bit further around, is there not something a bit more innovative that we can do especially not just in the European and the US context, but also look towards some of the economies that have been dealing with this for a number of years or that has been dealing with hyperinflation. And I think there's some lessons we can learn there. Yes, so Dieter, one of the things that we're seeing in countries that are dealing with high levels of inflation, like Argentina, like Turkey, is that first of all, they have a clear policy on what they're doing and they communicate it regularly. And I think that is indeed a lesson that we can learn from them. I think it's also about what, what in these countries, what is happening is indexing salaries and, and checking, you know, are we still providing a living wage and it's not about creating a wage increase it's about you know matching the increasing costs of living so that people can keep the same living standard and they index that multiple times a year i'm i'm curious what what as an organization you know next to having a clear communication strategy and communicating clearly to employees. What are some of the other things that companies should do and implement in order to be ahead of this discussion? I think firstly, Eric, there is also the component around helping employees from a financial well-being and from a financial advice perspective. I think there's some of those preventative elements that we can look at to give advice to employees on how do you restructure debt, how do you just think differently about some of your living costs that you have currently. But I think there's also then on the other side the equation that we have to think a little bit more flexibly around the REM and reward component and the incentivization and allowances that we do have. And how can no. we flex some of those during this particular period? So I think, Eric, that shifts us very much towards the second trend and the theme that you've mentioned really around rising labor unrest that we hmm. see. And I think especially across Europe at the moment, we're seeing 
industries and countries all of a sudden dealing with strikes on quite a frequent basis, which is not necessarily something that we used to hear. Do we believe that the employer-employee relationship has taken some damage? And how can we fix that as part of this particular theme? I do have the feeling that there's a rising discontent. And I think in Europe that has to do with, with the rising cost of living and gas prices and just a high level of uncertainty. And I think it also there's also a role to play for organizations that are you know still reported uh, making good profit margins, but at the same time tightening the belt in preparation of a recession. And I think that is a, for a big part of communication where where employees feel like you know they're tightening their own belt while most organizations are still doing quite well and still quite profitable but are preparing for a recession that's to come so i think there's a big part in communication between hr and the organization and the employee that is just not being done well and i think that is creating discontent amongst mm-hmm. workers and that is also why we see those strikes in the royal mail i think ups is now also ups workers are threatening to strike there's just a lot of strikes happening because of that mm-hmm. discontent and i think because of a shifted perception that we should address as HR. Definitely agree with that because I think this is the culmination of a whole bunch of things that's happened over the, you know, call it the past couple of years around you know, what does critical work look like, uh, who yeah. gets paid what, transparency yeah. on the other side as well. And I think what it should be flagging to us as HR practitioners is that I think it's really time to do some call it deep culture and values work around how do we really build a culture of trust? What does that look like? How does that translate back into our practices? And I think a lot of companies are also experiencing, call it in the post-COVID era, that a lot of employees are now thinking differently about work, and which then yeah. arises a lot of these types of questions you know, in terms of yeah. how are we going to do this? Does this really matter? Should there not be something more? Um, and I think we'll see a lot more with regards to that. Culture is a difficult one. Um, how can HR approach it? Because I know it's always one of those abstract concepts that everybody wants to do, but nobody wants to touch. So how do we go about that? That will depend on the organization, because what we're seeing in a lot of these strikes is that it's it's mostly deskless workers who are mm-hmm. unhappy. And and on the one hand, that makes sense because, you know, they may not have the, 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 the biggest salary, so they will feel the pain the, the earliest. But I think it also has to do with kind of the trembles of the pandemic that we're still feeling, where we see a lot of mm-hmm. deskless workers, you know, white collar workers uh, working from home that's all fine and they have a lot of additional benefits that they gained over the past couple of years i think at the same time we see this discontent among deskless workers that who really haven't gotten many of those benefits who are still stuck in that same culture where they have been for a long time already and now they're also um, looking at rising inflation and a rising cost of living and i i wonder dieter if that culture piece doesn't mostly relate to organizations with a majority of deskless workers shouldn't there be something done for those organizations, because that's also where the strikes are happening. I think so. I think, you know, and I talk from my own past experience, employee value propositions, unfortunately, sometimes at the time, it's easier to design them for, call them professional service organizations Mm. or professional um, service employees, because I think there's a lot more levers available. I think what we are seeing now, and it's almost as if, you know, the voice of the employee is, is all of a sudden really starting to speak out to say, but, you know, there's a forgotten audience that we don't necessarily think about and we try to govern mm. through process and policy. And I think there's more we can do there around what is the experience of the deskless worker, you know, to touch on the previous theme that you mentioned as well, you know, with regards to, unfortunately, it's usually those employees from a minimum wage point of view that's hit hardest by some of these changes that we find yeah. within the organization. Yeah. I used to tease our head of reward and I said, you know, we spend 70% of our time thinking about how are we going to incentivize the 10% of employees that's probably going to utilize their bonus, you know, for a holiday home versus actually talking about the 90% of the of the audience that, you know, actually need that to make ends meet. And yeah. I think we have to rethink what is the deskless worker's experience look like and what is our relationship there and how are we going to make it worth it? Because unfortunately during COVID, I think a lot of industries, that was where they first cut a lot of their employees. And that's why a lot of people don't want to go back to those industries. The airline industry is a very good example of that at the moment. Yeah. So I think it is part culture. It is um, part remuneration, but it is also a much larger discussion of you know, reinventing that employee value proposition, that EVP for your deskless workers. And I think organizations need to do a better job at that. And I think one of the risks that we're seeing is that HR is still in a very much operational and kind of trying to deal with, mm. with you know, a war in Ukraine, with with some of these, some of these tensions uh, still having their hands full and not really thinking of how can we proactively communicate about remuneration, about uh, increasing and, and, and bettering that employee value proposition, maybe even bringing in technology to, to 
to create you know more uh, autonomy for these deskless workers and i think there's a lot of potential interesting solution when it comes to technology that we can help to support that employee value proposition i think despite all the things that hr has uh, on their plate i think this should be a priority and this should be something that hr spends more time on i agree with that i think if if hr does not spend time on this i think we will start seeing a lot more of the behavior which pushes us to our third trend where you wanted to talk about quiet quitting, the great resignation and the anti-work movement. Yeah, because quiet quitting, you've heard about it probably in the news, but for a long time I've been reading about it. I didn't really understand what it means, but it's essentially, you know, just doing your job, doing the, 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 the bare necessities to not be fired. But that's it. And then afterwards, you know, you uh, uh, enjoy Facebook on your laptop or you uh, you go home when you're working from home and you go do something else. That's, you know, anti-work movements um, uh, or, or some of the some of the trends we were seeing also in, in Asia where people push against that, you know, 996 model where you work from 9 to 9 for six days a week. We're seeing more and more of that. And I think that is also a result of some of that that mm -hmm. discontent that we're seeing in the employee population. And I'm wondering, Dieter, because, you know, you and I are both fairly workaholics. We love our work. We like what we do. Is this kind of an, 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 a reaction against that hustle culture that we used to have five, ten years ago, you know, where you pull yourself up by your own boots and, and you know, you go for it? Is this kind of an anti-movement for it? Or what, what, what can we expect towards the future for this anti-work movement and quiet quitting? Is it the end of excited employees, you know, who are engaged and who love to work? Where is this going and what is the role of HR? I think the first thing there is we need to acknowledge that quiet quitting is not a new thing, right? I think it's been packaged very nicely at the moment in terms of the conversation. But, you know, looking at employee disengagement, that's something that's been really well studied over a number of years. And I think we need to go back to really understand why are employees disengaged? And one of the key things that I think is popping up where the quiet quitting movement does have a very, very good point to make is really around unrealistic expectations. And think about the language around what we reward at work, person staying late, discretionary effort. These are all the things that we are taught growing up that this is what you should aspire to in your career. And that's yeah. what makes a good employee. I think the narrative is shifting. And I think that's where HR needs to play a role to say, how do we have a much more balanced narrative? So I think it is to take a considered approach, but really think about, you know, what are we really asking of employees? And are we balancing demands with really the resources that they need to be able to be productive and well. So when we talk about these job resources, you know, mm -hmm. it's about autonomy and giving people autonomy, giving people um, the ability to manage themselves and their own careers and their own work, the ability to job craft and to, to mm -hmm. give their work shape. But I think there's also a tension there because if you have the feeling that people are quietly quitting, mm -hmm. do you want to give them more autonomy or do you want to you know hover over them and start to micromanage and make sure that they work 40 hours a week if they have a 40 hour a week contract there's a tension there mm. how do we manage that and i think that's such a difficult thing to get right because on the one end you're going to find especially and i feel for for managers and leaders in in the setup at the moment as well you know if i'm managing a big team how much time and attention can i really spend to get to the root cause of this but it does lie for me in how do we build the relationship between managers and employees because i think there's a lot of work there that has to be done and i think at that level then there is the opportunity for us to look at you know i'm a very big fan of job crafting as you've mentioned but that has to happen within the context of a trust relationship mm. yeah i agree dieter and that also brings us to the topic of you know working from home where you have all, almost the ultimate autonomy to structure your days to schedule your agenda um i and i think that's the last element and i think you have a couple of headlines when it comes to working from home i think what's been interesting and with us going back to work i think spatial strategies as the work from home debate is going to continue to be very interesting to see how organizations approach that there's two headlines that really caught my eye in this theme the first one was this, that says real estate investors bet on the suburbs so also companies mm -hmm. really changing where they want to set up work locations and i think we're going to see a lot more of that obviously that with the rising cost of living that we've spoken about i think is going to be very interesting to see where people then go and choose to live and how people can connect with regards to that but i think the work from home debate is not over and i think we need to start solving that in a in a way that is viable for organizations with all the other things that's happening there as well what do you think is the next conversation there I think the next conversation should be much more holistic because we've been touching on four different themes. We've been talking about inflation and the impact that makes um, labor unrest and the, the different expectations that employees have of employers. We've been talking about quiet quittings, uh, quiet quitting and, you know, people just being disengaged from their roles, uh, what we're seeing. And, and then, you know, organizations are still not clear on working from home, yes or no, you know. 
it, it still feels like it's a it's something that we've been talking about for years already and there's still no clear decision on this is the new norm so i think it really calls for a reinvention of the employee value proposition and companies need to do this in a very much a proactive way and i think that touches on your remuneration and your remuneration strategy i think that touches on a lot of different areas but i think it should be a holistic conversation that we should have because at least in, in europe the perception that i have is that things are becoming less stable with all the strikes with the, the unrest that is happening we need hr to step up even though hr is uh, busy hr has a lot on their plate we need hr to be proactive when it comes to redefining that employee value proposition Dieter. i th agree with that and i think there's also there's other parties that we need to bring to the table to have that conversation i think i'm very excited to see what organizations will do around spatial strategies also bearing in mind that that is one of those things that takes a very long period of time you know whenever you go into the real estate market companies deciding not to renew leases or deciding to set up new office spaces that typically takes a, a while so i do think we need to give that some thought now in the context of what you've described as the longer term viability of what this is going to look like i think it can be quite an exciting period but i do agree with you there's too many things that's still up in the air where organizations have kind of a perspective on it but they don't mm -hmm. really action it yet and waiting for other people to see what's going to happen is there I agree with you. I think it is a great time to be in HR because there's so much happening and we are reinventing the world of work and the employee value proposition. And I think the changes that we're seeing in the past couple of years and in the next couple of years, I think they will redefine the way we will work in the future. And that is why I'm very excited to talk about these topics. And that's why I'm very excited uh, uh, to be in HR because I think, as I said, it is a great time to be in HR. And with that, we're wrapping up, Dieter. Before you go, don't forget to like this video and subscribe to our channel. We are investing a lot in our video content at AIHR and we'll ramp it up as well. So if you want to stay tuned, don't forget to subscribe to our channel. And if you have anything to say, you know, anything you disagree with us or anything you do agree with us, do leave us a comment down below. With that, I would like to thank you very, very much. This is Dieter Veldsman. I'm Eric van Vulpen and would like to wish you an absolutely brilliant day. Bye-bye.